Quick assist. No, I don't mean the quick assist thing that's built into Windows like a help desk thing. I mean Intel. Quick assist. QAT. Intel's betting the farm on their accelerators, so let's give it an honest, fair look. I've got quick assist hardware, and if you've got quick assist hardware, you definitely should be using it. I've done some videos in the past on that, but I want to show you just how easy it is to get up and running with it and explain a little bit more about why it's so important. You see, Quick Assist is a CPU feature that's outside the core. It's an accelerator, and it's probably going to be part of the next big battleground in the CPU core wars, at least for server CPUs. It's completely flying under everybody's radar, and QAT takes an approach to data compression and decompression and encryption and decryption that really is pretty elegant in actuality. And probably the best approach for dealing with large blocks of data. And Intel actually has a 10-year head start with QAT. But are they going to blow it? Uh, if you've come to depend on QAT, it's hard to give it up. You know. And I think Intel's product segmentation up till now has been part of why it hasn't been as widely adopted as uh, maybe it should have been. But I hope that Intel doesn't blow it. I uh, actually do like the technology. And the technology is nice. And AMD's approach here is uh, different <laughs> than what Intel has done with Quick Assist, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But Quick Assist is also still not well understood because it's something that's outside the CPU core, and it's a battleground? Yeah, it could actually be really, really important for the next generations of CPUs going forward. But why? Why would it be a battleground in that? You know, what sense does it make to put something on a CPU that's not a CPU, it's not part of the core? Well, uh, that's what this video is for. Let's take a closer look. Let me show you how easy this is. All right, here on our system, we're setting up ZFS to do compression with Quick Assist. Well, uh, Quick Assist can help you do compression with ZFS? Yeah, because it's just a generic accelerator. It's made for processing lots of data. It's versatile. And this is an experimental support in ZFS, hence this experiment. This level of support for Quick Assist, that's already kind of here, is mind-blowing. And we take a look at, uh, uh, you know, a virtualization distribution like Proxmox, and there's some really awesome options there. But to start, we're going to take a look at Vanilla Ubuntu 22.04 LTS. I installed it on our dual CPU Sapphire Rapids 8490H. It has everything and a total uh, of four QAT accelerators per socket. That's eight in this chassis. Engagement challenge. What server CPUs do you have and do they have quick assist? Uh, if you're not sure, you can always check the Intel Arc website. Intel Arc website is uh, tremendously useful for figuring out what your CPU has built in. And some of these can actually be unlocked with a license key or uh, uh, other uh, maneuvering at a later point. But uh, anyway, you don't actually need the top end 8490H to get these accelerators. I've got another couple systems we'll take a look at in, in a little bit. But for now, yeah, Xeon Platinum top line kind of makes sense. Although top of the line CPUs don't necessarily have it. And the ZFS file system, well, it's handy in that it can compress data transparently. But I'm modifying it to pass the compression part of the file system through to the QAT part of the CPU. I wrote a guide in the Level 1 Text Forum. And you can follow along with this video. You can look at that. But there's not a lot to do. Basically, can you do LSPCI and see that the device showed up? Okay, it did. And not only that, if we check out LSMod and see that the kernel already has loaded the kernel module for this, that means that we've got the firmware and everything else. The Linux firmware image in our case, so the package is going to bring down the firmware images for us. It's pretty awesome. If your kernel's up to date and you get the Linux firmware package and it's a reasonably recent distro, the device is already there in slash dev, at least to get started. There's some more stuff you can do to add more devices and fun other things, but yeah, it's basically there. The big part that we're missing is the QAT libraries. Those are Intel's libraries to get stuff done with this, so we'll have to download and set that up. And that's basically all we have to do to compile ZFS with support for QAT is to get those libraries and make sure those devices exist. And before you say, well, but modern CPUs are actually really good at software compression. Yes, that is true. And if you shelled out for an 8490H, you'd hardly notice a difference between QAT and non-QAT uh, compression. You know, if you want to do Z standard up to level 9, you've got cores for days. So why don't you just do it on a core? But what if the server's fully loaded? Well, with QAT, it means whatever 
job you're running on your CPUs that's making the workload is not competing with the compression job that's part of the file system. You see, your CPUs can be busy doing the workload, but also busy with background jobs. And the more background jobs you can offload into those accelerators on the CPU, the more room you'll have for your actual job that you're trying to run. This is also kind of like using a GPU for acceleration. You know, you've got movies, you want to transcode them, and it takes forever to do it on the CPU if you can do it with the GPU. Uh, but this is the highest end Xeon Platinum system. What about something else? I mentioned you don't need the 8490H, how low can you go? Well, I've got this Emerald Rapid system that I borrowed from Supermicro. Now this is not a top of stack CPU system, but this is an insanely powerful system with quick memory, bus, speed, but it's very far from the top of stack but it's also not quite low end either. The CPUs in here cost about a third of what the 8490Hs cost, and it's almost fast enough to handle full disk encryption at 100 gigabytes per second from an array of Kyoxia CM7s in the front. And yeah, it can saturate 400 gigabit ethernet with ease when we're talking about encrypted TLS connections too. So you don't have to have the top of the top. The system is not at all top of stack for Intel, but this is the perfect system for us to bottleneck neither the disk nor the network card. But what about even lower? Well, it's sort of part of how QAT came to be as well supported as it is. I'll grant you that it's a low key, but it is ubiquitous. How low can you go? Well, if we take a detour for a second and talk about Atom cores, Atom cores can have quick assist. PFSense, for example, a router distribution of FreeBSD. It's really popular with home labbers, and it's very, very popular in the commercial space. It uses AESNI for VPN acceleration. That's a CPU core instruction set that accelerates crypto. But it also has support for QAT. And QAT is about four to six times faster, especially on low-end hardware, than even AESNI. Modern internet routers do so much encryption and decryption that AESNI is basically not enough, and it's a minimum requirement at this point. Oh, and while we're on this detour, how this came to be is interesting. So let's go back in time a little bit further. When I say Atom Cores, I mean the original Cherry Trail Atom Cores. Intel was facing a problem. We're, we're talking almost a decade ago. Well, not quite, but competitors were making inroads in telecommunications and other gear that needed cryptographic functions that take a lot of CPU horsepower. They were using add in hardware and specialized chips to do that acceleration. So if you want to run a cell phone tower with thousands upon thousands of connections, and it's going to take monster expensive server CPUs, right? No, you, you, you didn't really need a lot of CPU horsepower to just shuffle data in and out from radios to fiber optics, because in those days, there wasn't very much that was encrypted. But when somebody rolls up and pretends to be the neighboring cell phone tower or somebody wants to uh, impersonate you on your fiber backhaul, well, that's not very secure. Solution was to encrypt everything uh, on both sides, not just cryptography for security, but cryptography to make sure that there's no tampering between the endpoints that are communicating. Compressing the communications also gives you extra bandwidth so you don't have to run wires or even increase the speed of the existing telecommunication stuff that you got. This is where Intel competitors really were making some strides. Competitors could offer specialized hardware to do that assurance, the security assurance, security crypto compression, basically just plug in these third-party chips or controllers or deploy them on a board, let the x86 and the Intel stuff do the Intel stuff, but you got these boxes that have specialized hardware and x86, and that takes care of it. The specialized chips would do the work, and the x86 cores were just used for control and management. You actually still see that in some Ethernet switches today. We've covered Arista switches in the past. It's a little tiny x86 control and like big giant Broadcom chipsets that do the Ethernet part of it. Now, Intel could solve this problem by giving telecoms a monster mini core CPU with something like AESNI on 56 cores or 64 cores. That would do it. But those customers in the telecom industry that want compression and encryption, they were not willing to pay as much for a mini core CPU as data center customers were already paying for the same CPU. It's a bit of a market segmentation problem for Intel. And the telecom customers wouldn't be using most of the rest of the functionality in an x86 core anyway. Thus was born quick assist and accelerators like that. And also kind of in parallel and at the same time, uh, other markets were finding creative uses for Intel E3 Xeons, the lowest end Xeons, but they're also the only Xeons that came with a GPU. And it was very modest as far as GPUs go, but people were finding creative ways to have those GPUs do workloads. 
And that's sort of the environment that Quick Assist was born in. I mean, Quick Assist paired with modest, and I do mean very modest, x86 cores, could encrypt and decrypt at 10 gigabit wire speed. And that's when 10 gigabit was blisteringly fast. Without Quick Assist, those cores would never have been able to manage 10 gigabit. Probably not even 2.5 gigabit. Probably more like 700 megabit. Hey, wait, wait a minute. That's how fast my PF sensor router is at home could do on the VPN before AES-NI support became mandatory. Yeah, we'll get to that. If you have a home lab or you have experience with PFSense in the commercial setting, you've probably discovered with your repurposed old hardware that without AES-NI, it really can't do certain things really super fast. Now you know why, because you need hardware assist. Quick Assist does kind of work more like a video in code, like a GPU does, than the way that it would with CPU instructions, like having a CPU core do the work. But that's probably a story for another day. I've, I've rambled too much on this. This is our 8490H that we're remoted into. And just out of the box, you've got the one ADF control. So looking pretty good. QAT underscore four XXX. There's different versions of QAT that support different algorithms and they also run at different speeds. It could not possibly be more confusing. You've seen the AVX 512 Venn diagram of human suffering, QAT versions, etc. kind of a little worse. And because we haven't set up any of the QAT user library stuff or services or followed the, the guide, um, the QAT service doesn't exist. These are our eight QAT devices in LSPCI. Remember to check Intel Arc because you might only have one or two or four, depending on your system. It's also true that sometimes when you update the QAT library version, you get new crypto support. Pharonix has a good article on that. You should check that out. Basically, it's a software update, and it's like, oh, look, new cryptography standards are supported with the same old QAT hardware. That's pretty much it. I wish it was more complicated than that, but... On modern distros, it almost works out of the box. You just need to do a couple of steps to get the user libraries, and you're good to go. What's not to love? Can't stand the thought of all that compute just sitting there idle. It could be doing stuff. So QAT is a way to <laughs> uncore, compress, and encrypt. Uh, you know, we showed the, in the use case of Nginx before. You can offload TLS, the web encryption. And that really sped things up more than I expected. I was sort of shocked by that, which is why I'm doing this. Um, and by the way, this system with the device and the modules and the firmware, it's ready for Docker, just like the other video. So if you want to just start using Docker, you're, you're good to go. So what Xeons do you have access to? Use Intel Arc, see if you've got QAT. It might be worth some experiments on your own. For Docker on this system, if you want to go that route instead of ZFS or both, all you need to do is add a QAT security group and give it access, give Docker, the host, access to the QAT devices. And that's in the Intel docs, but there's also some hints about that in my guide on the forum. From there, you're ready to run Docker containers that can leverage QAT. Are you out of ideas for Docker containers? Well, Intel's Open Visual Cloud GitHub repository has a lot of good resources that will use QAT and some of the other Intel hardware facilities. And check out my other videos and forum posts and getting, you know, this kind of thing set up with Nginx. But what about Windows? I did our Falcon Northwest 56 core system as the ultimate machine learning system. And I'm still doing that with CUDA and AMX. And there is no faster machine for OpenVINO. But this is based on a Xeon W CPU. Xeon Ws don't have quick assist. And I think this is kind of a strategic mistake by Intel. They're, they're putting AMX and AI in basically everything. And OpenVINO goes fast, faster than anything on this platform. But... QAT, which really would be useful from a developer standpoint, even if it's an anemic implementation of QAT, just so I can run my local Docker containers and then I can migrate them from dev to production. I mean, it's sort of a misstep. But there is really good support for QAT in Windows, Microsoft SQL Server, Glenn Vary, Microsoft SQL Server MVP on his blog. We've done videos in the past. You can run QAT hardware acceleration with a huge benefit. You've got a 16 core system that's fully loaded, that's licensed by the core. If you have the QAT accelerator, you get the backup compression for free basically because it doesn't run on a core. So if you're, you know, your SQL server is fully loaded and you need to run a backup, your users are uh, gonna notice unless you're using QAT hardware, in which case it's less likely that they're gonna notice because the compression is not competing with the SQL 
operation on the on the CPU cores, and so it's not fighting between the SQL data and the compression job because it's running somewhere else. That's pretty awesome. And the QAT doesn't count against the licensing, so you don't need to buy extra cores and try to cordon off some of them. And uh, You should just check out Glenn Berry's blog posts and uh, the videos that we've done in the past, so be sure to check that out. And yeah, that's on Windows Server. It's full support there. So to take us out, I mentioned this as kind of a battleground. Intel has embraced chiplet architecture. They have silicon for compute and they have silicon for I.O. Compression, encryption, and data transformation jobs handled by a QAT type accelerator, not on the core, but on the I.O. die, off of the CPU. And yeah, you got all that transistor count and real estate in an I.O. die. It makes sense from a design perspective. And while AMD could add similar resources like this inside their own I.O. die, it seems like their strategy is different. So, for example, with their Pensando acquisition, the same type of encryption that I showed with QAT on the Intel CPU in the last video, that's more equivalent to what they're doing on the Pensando network card. So, in this case, the network card is doing all the encryption and decryption offloaded from the CPU. It's not an on-CPU resource. And that kind of makes sense from a TLS standpoint, but this is a fundamentally different approach than what we see with uh, Intel and what they're doing inside their CPUs. And as good as QAT is, I think Intel is being very, very careful to segment their products, uh, and that has probably cost them some adoption of this kind of technology. Can an x86 core get good enough to handle wire speed 100 gigabit encryption? Well, so far it hasn't. It, it needs some type of acceleration to do this. You're going to burn all of your CPU overhead trying to handle very small packets and encryption when that is really better served by a uh, an IC that's built for the job. Now, to be sure, designing a CPU, it's a balancing act where... Uh, you know, you've only got so much real estate, so many transistors. And Intel and AMD have gone in a different direction. From a system architecture standpoint, instruction sets like AVX512 and AES-NI can help with some of these encryption and, and you know, those kinds of workloads. But it's still not as efficient or as elegant as QAT. If you're rocking PFSense, for example, QAT is dramatically faster than AES-NI. Oh, and I mentioned Proxmox. In addition to this basically being ready for plug and play, like we just set up Linux and it's like the QAT devices were there, it had the firmware. With Sapphire Rapids and Emerald Rapids, you can do SRIOV on your QAT devices. But I'm going to have to save that for the next video because I'm already running a little long. If you want to jump ahead, the right up on the level one forum will get you started for that. Basically, all you got to do is enable IOMMU, turn on SRIOV, set some kernel parameters, and then the kernel will actually populate the VFIO PCI uh, driver for those QAT devices, which you can then pass through to a virtual machine. And that can run Docker and run your QAT machines and all that kind of stuff. And the hardware will handle scheduling all the different QAT jobs on your eight physical QAT accelerators, at least in the case of the Xeon Platinum, or one or two QAT accelerators that you might have in your uh, your other platform. But that's, that's going to be a video for another day. But engagement challenge, what accelerators do you have access to? Are you using them? Uh, tell me a little bit more. Help me sort of shape the next couple of videos in this series. Because I've got some kind of high-end hardware here. And I've been taking it for a spin. And I've been surprised in some ways. And in other ways, it's like, ah, I sort of get what Intel is doing with their overall strategy. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it works out for him. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. Mm -hmm.